next um, few days. And, um, and we'll have a Q&A session if time permits at the end. So in the meantime, as we're going through, feel free to just drop your notes, comments, questions into the chat. And we'll endeavour to come back to you on those um, either during the session or at the end. Um, we'll do our best anyway, again, time permitting. So we'll start off um, by acknowledging country. So we'd like to honour and pay our respects to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders and people, both past, present and future, and the spirit that binds us in our dreams and aspirations on this land and in this community. We acknowledge the beauty, the sincerity and the resilience that will give us confidence to move forward in peace and with respect to our land, our place and each other. So with that said, I'm really pleased uh, to be joined today by our two speakers. First, we've got Lisa Vincent. Lisa is an entrepreneur and co-founder of Savvy. And Savvy is one of Australia's most successful and multi-award winning digital learning agencies. And more recently, Lisa has co-founded How To an AI-enabled <clears throat> SaaS rapid authoring tool platform, which is disrupting the workplace learning space. Thank Welcome, you, Lisa. Thank you, Lola. Yola, lovely to be here. We've also got the pleasure of having Gina Haidu with us. Gina's got over 10 years experience as a leadership coach and organizational development professional. She's worked predominantly in large corporates and with very complex stakeholder environments. Gina recently moved to Campbelltown City Council as training and capability lead. We're really um, excited to have Gina with us today um, to share her experience and expertise and talk about a specific e-learning project at Council. So welcome, Gina. Can you tell us a little bit about the project you and your team have been working on? Yeah, hi, Yola. Thanks for having me uh, on today. Talk about a learning curve and, you know, just when you think that... Um, Corporate is, is a complex environment. Um, I'm impressed by uh, the breadth uh, of, of what's here at, at Council. So it's a pretty exciting place to be. Um, look, our, our, I've been here, gosh, it seems longer, but um, about six, seven months now. Um, and I'm working on a project right now. It's intended to highlight our culture uh, and to promote ways in which we create a great place to work uh, by living our values. Um, and it's aimed at all employees, which makes it interesting um, to, to, to try to get the pitch right. Um, and it's, I think, particularly helpful for new employees who are still learning you know, what's expected of, of them. Um, it was a project that was started initially by a former team member, so I'm picking up that piece. Uh, and I just see it as a really great learning experience for me, and I'm excited to be using um, the tool um, to, to deliver this. Great, thank you, Gina. We're certainly excited to hear more about how you went about creating this e-learning piece. <clears throat> so today, as you all know, we're going to be exploring the five must-haves for e-learning 2021. It does continue to evolve, this whole e-learning space, and indeed COVID-19 has been a catalyst for many organisations to sort of re-look and reimagine how they're going to deliver um, learning to their people. And thankfully, technology is keeping pace. So at the moment, you'll see on the screen uh, a URL um, to menti.com uh, and there'll be a code to use. If you could help, um, jump in on that, we're going to do a quick poll. Just want to explore how many of you today um, are doing learning and, and how you're doing that, whether it's online, face-to-face -face or blended. So if you could pop in your responses quickly, that'd be really appreciated and we'll get an idea of uh, how you're delivering your learning at the moment. Yeah, you can access by a phone or computer. Thank you. We'll just give it a minute for everyone to respond. Don't be shy. We can confidently say at Savvy and How To, we deliver our learning online. <laughs> so if anybody's having <laughs> troubles, it's, um, yeah, you just go to that menti.com URL and then they'll ask you for the code and then you just answer the question. Do you have to open the question? Just put the, the code. question isn't open. Megan, can you kindly open the question? 
Yes, we're just having a bit of a tech issue there. Um, you can always post your comments um, and questions and the answers in the chat if it's not working for you. Yeah, sorry. That issue. I did say technology is keeping pace, so, you know, <laughs> the irony of my comment. Gina, um, a comment from you in terms of your delivery at Campbelltown. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Oh, no, that's okay. You know me, I could talk underwater. I do, yeah. <laughs> um, that's why we've got you on here, right? Yeah. Um, look, it, it, we have to take a blended approach. I mean, you know, it, it's, um, it depends on the, the complexity of the content, um, you know, how much we want people to interact with it and, and sort of the level of learning that we want people to take away from it. So, you know, I, I really always prefer to do, say, leadership training, for example, face-to-face uh, -face if we can. Um, and then, you know, just do some embedding pieces, uh, like say by webinar or online. So I, I think a real, a blended learning approach is great for us and partly as well, because we've got, you know, a workforce that's spread across, um, you know, a, a large area. So we, we need to make it, a, you know, easily accessible for everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Gina. And thanks for, for everyone that's um, putting your comments in chat. There's definitely from everyone a, a mix um it looks like um a combination of both so blended approach across um the councils of the responded thank you for that okay we may move on and tackle the first must have create a learning persona lisa let's kick this one off with you um share with us your opinion on you know what's the starting point to designing and creating great digital learning and how that learning persona must have comes into play. Yeah, thanks, Yola. Look, I, I find the best place to start is really to develop persona or even a number of personas. Um, and so probably many of you have heard of personas. Um, they're often used in marketing, but we also use them in learning and even in software development. And what they are, are they are well-developed fictional profiles that really reflect the target audience uh, that we are designing for. Because um, learners are really the key stakeholder in any project uh, that we're creating. And if we don't have them kind of front and center in our mind, um, the, the, the solution that we're designing or that, you know, that will not be successful. Um, and what it does is it just keeps us very learner centered. Um, and I would suggest you, I quite like putting the learner persona, a picture of them, and maybe we can see an example on the next screen. Um, I like to put um, the persona actually on the wall, a picture, and have them kind of front in mind when we're designing the solution. Um, so you can see on the next screen, if we can just move to the next screen, here is an example of a persona who's Jim at a depot worker. and. When you're putting persona together, it's um, you're giving them a description, a bit of their, their their age, their gender, their personal situation, what are their goals, and and that's really important to understand because we need to design and motivate because learning is a we need to motivate people to learn, um, and pain points they're having. So understanding those will really help us uh, create the learning effectively. And what's their preferences? How do they like to learn? what's their attitudes to learning, their personality style, those sorts of things. So these are really important to not just do them at the beginning and then leave them, but actually keep them front of mind through the process. Yeah, totally. Look, um, I think, you know, particularly important not to lose sight of the audience, right, um, to make yeah. sure that content's speaking directly to them. So really the question is, you know, what if you have a really diverse workforce like councils do, we all know, um, uh, that councils have many, many, you know, jobs and personas and so forth. So, Jen, I'll throw this to you. Um, what process has your team been taking to create persona and what's the biggest challenge you face when creating e-learning for all of council, like you have for this mm -hmm. particular project that you mentioned at the beginning? Yeah, um, look, I, <laughs> I'm always looking for ways to do it really efficiently, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, and it's a real challenge because we do have a wonderfully diverse group of employees um, to design for. Um, and so, you know, creating personas is, is quite tricky. So when I'm designing, I try and roll quite a few traits into one persona. So just a bit like this slide. 
Um, and um, one thing all of us share that we found is, is we all want to get the most out of the learning um, and we want to um, you know, keep the time short and sharp. So keeping it practical, clear and short really seems to be common across all learners. Um, you know, I was really hoping I could do like, you know, one persona and roll it all, you know, roll everything. Yeah. But it actually just doesn't make sense as I'm learning. Like you, you really, then then you don't know, you've lost the focus. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm learning that, no, I'm really going to have to slow down and, and do, you know, at least two or three personas, probably more like four um, to capture the breadth um, uh, of employees. So, um, yeah, look, and, and like you said, Yola, it's really important to keep returning back to the personas I find so that you don't lose focus and that you're meeting all the needs of, of the learners, particularly when it's aimed at, you know, something like all employees, you really, uh, you really have to come back to the personas to get it right. Yeah, thanks, Gina. Um, feel free to everyone out there on the, on the uh, call to put into the chat, you know, how you're finding it and and whether you're, you are or have been or perhaps will be now using personas uh, to create, um, to help create content. Uh, so our second uh, must have is what outcomes that are practical, measurable and achievable. Lisa, 20 years working for Savvy and now how to, uh, it's a lot of experience. What would you say is the secret of writing great um, uh, e-learning outcomes? Uh, yeah, so I would say that it's important to write them. Um, mm. I think anybody here today um, would have written learn or knows about learning outcomes if you've been designing digital or even face-to-face -face learning solutions. So, um, you know, I think most of you would know what they are, but sometimes I think we maybe lose sight of them or do them just as a procedure. Um, so what I would suggest is that we do them with meaning and focus and we do see the value in them because really um, kind of workplace learning is all about pe helping people be successful in their roles. And that means that we need to support them in helping them do their job successfully. Uh, so when we put our learning outcome together, we need to be careful to make sure that we're writing verbs that um, actually are, are, are doing word, not just a knowing or an understanding. So I'm sure, you know, many of you would have been aware, you would be aware of Bloom's taxonomy, which is really sort of a hierarchy of, of learning outcomes. Um, and what that helps us do is identify, I suppose, the lower order thinking outcomes, which are more, you know, the recalling, the stating, the describing. And then we move through all of the different levels of understanding um, and, and, and learning. Um, and we move to more higher order thinking, which is more in very much, if you can create or design something, then that's a much a higher order learning outcome that you're creating. Uh, and it's sort of at how to, we're sort of so passionate about learning outcomes that we actually have embedded it in the software itself. So basically when you come in, you actually identify the outcome that you want for your learner. So you enter in the active verb and the outcome and the object. So a typical um, sort of format, which again, you may be aware of is you write a learning outcome in the, in the terms of at the end of this module, the learner will be able to do something. And I think we've got an example on the next screen. Um, so we've got the Campbelltown example here. At the end of the learning experience, the learner will be able to identify the values of Campbelltown Council. Um, and I know Jean is going to talk a little bit about the challenges in putting that learning outcome together. But yeah, I think choosing, um, choosing a verb that's a doing word and choosing the right verb I think is important and continually returning to that outcome during the design process is really, really important. And it really helps you make decisions as to what's in and out in terms of the content. Great, thanks Lisa. And Gina, I know that you're, you know, the piece that you're talking about has a lot of topics, a lot of things in there, right? And culturally, et cetera. So, um, you know, I know it's really critical to have that, that step, that outcome step. 
how did you approach it and apply that to this particular project? Yeah, um, look, it, it was challenging because the outcomes mm. of uh, their cultural outcomes. Mm. So, you know, their behavior base. So we would use, you know, terms like, you know, identify certainly when it comes to the values, but also to demonstrate a particular behavior um, linked with that, uh, with that value. Um, and so, you know, when it's behavior based, it can be a little hard to measure, like, you know, that's part of it, setting the outcomes, but then making sure that you can measure them. So, um, you know, we, we aim to describe how the values are lived in a really practical way um, and reinforce that by giving examples um, that, that highlight the desired behavior that, you know, we're looking for. Um, and, you know, I, I think that also gives us a shared, you know, an idea of what the shared idea of what the behavior looks like. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's quite important as well for us to be able to measure, you know, are we getting the out, what are the outcomes, are we getting them? Um, and, and we do, we make it a little bit more robust by um, doing some follow-up measures. Um, things like quick pulse engagement surveys to um, help us zero in on what behaviors are being demonstrated um, through some targeted questions that we add. And um, we take opportunities uh, to attend team meetings across council when we can and highlight the values-based behavior. So kind of keeping it on the agenda and keeping conversations going um, about what we're looking for. And um, we've, um, we've got cultural recognition awards additionally that help reward and again, keep focus on the lived values. So not just what we talk about, but what we live. And those are just some of the measures that we're using. Um, but I think the verbs for us are quite simple about, you know, demonstrate uh, and the examples are, we aim to be, you know, really, really clear in the uh, examples we provide as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Gina. <clears throat> uh, so we've got the learning persona, got the learning outcome. What's the next step? Uh, structuring content into logical parts of applying learning science is what we've got here. And that's certainly easier said than done, right? Um, can you break this down for us, Lisa? Where do you start? Yeah, so I find it quite a good technique is just to start brainstorming the content um, into a bit of a mind map and then start chunking the content into logical parts and logical topic areas. Uh, and then can keep referring back also to the outcome. Um, and then the next step is to start structuring that into a learning experience. And that's where we apply uh, our understanding of learning theories, learning science and neuroscience as to what's going to really work for this particular audience and this particular learning outcome that we're designing for. Uh, so one of my favourite models, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a newer model, is called the ages model. And um, what I like about this model so much is that it's, um, it's really applying what we've learned from neuroscience. And that some of that learning is more recent, um, but some of that sort of discovery. So there's sort of really four components to this model. Um, the first one is attention. So of course, it's really, really critical that we are capturing the learner's attention so that we're activating the brain region, which you probably know is the hippocampus, um, which you know, really captures the attention and gets people on board and that's critical. Um, so at the beginning of this uh, webinar, one example was using a question where we talked a little bit about your experience, how are you delivering learning within your organization? Um, other techniques can be telling a story, um, having an interaction, or maybe statistics, or so whatever it is you can use to really gain that attention and capture people right from the start. Um, the next key component of the ages model is, the, is generation. And so this is where we are connecting the, this content with other con existing content that people or, or knowledge or skills that people always have. As, as soon as they start developing a connection and generating connections between what's in this learning experience and what you already know or what you can already do, 
you're going to improve the learning um, and strengthening the web of that learning. Uh, emotional, emotion connection. So there's been a lot of work done on um, if, if you actually tap into people's emotion, you're going to significantly increase their attention. Uh, so what it does is it activates the amygdala and <coughs> when that's activated, it also alerts the hippocampus. So it actually then also improves memory. So I don't know, when you think about experiences you've had, I know I certainly do. If I've had a strong emotional connection with that experience, my retention of, of what happened in that occasion is so much stronger uh, than if that emotion is not there. And the last principle is spacing, which is really, it's not about cramming the information. And this is also kind of where micro learning has become very popular um, is that it's small chunks and then we space, we have space where we can actually absorb and apply that learning um, and, and it improves our retention over time. Uh, and it makes, yeah, it makes the, um, yeah, it, it, it challenges people to, to forget, yeah, that you can, as soon as you start retrieving that on a regular basis and applying it, um, the learning is going to be a lot stronger. Right. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, I'd be keen to, to see um, uh, in the chat if uh, any of the councils on this call are using any other models. Um, certainly, you know, we've been using that uh, throughout Savvy, of course, when we're creating content and, and how to. So um, I personally have taken a lot of e-learning with that model uh, being used. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always helped, helped with my retention especially all the, uh, the, the, the scenarios and the, uh, the storytelling, I think is really critical. Um, humor is good too. I didn't mention that. And humor, humor, yeah. So I'm we all humor. retain content with it. So if you can, yeah. if there's any budding comedians and you can get that on track and on point, <laughs> that's quite a skill. We've got a couple of comedians in it, Savvy, that, um, yeah, give it a go. <laughs> oh, look, I grew up with dad jokes. So if you're okay with those, <laughs> the content, I'm happy to lend a hand. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for that, Lisa. That's really interesting, the Aegis model. Um, really encourage everyone to look that up and, and start thinking about using that in your, in your learning creation. So, Gina, you know, can you tell us now what the hardest part was for your piece and how to structure the content and how you overcame that challenge when it came to sort of, you know, structuring and bite-sized pieces and relevant content how did you how did you work well, through that look, um, the the one that you've got up on screen is uh, a very successful uh, piece of work that was done and, and we've rolled that out and so that's that's the you know the end state that yeah. um, I'm aiming to get to on this new piece that I'm that I'm working on so um, look <laughs> the cultural one I'm working on is is a whole lot of fun but um, I've, I've learned a new term recently which is um, I have to murder my darlings, which is disturbing because it sounds very violent to me. But what that really means is that I, I had way, way more content um, than I needed. And a lot of it I was really quite attached to, um, you know, that I thought would be great to include. And, um, but just thinking about, you know, some of the things we've spoken about earlier, like the need to keep the, the learning sort of short, sharp and quite practical for, for our learners. Um, I really reluctantly had to ditch a whole lot of great stuff uh, that I'm, that, you know, I'd accumulated in the design phase, um, you know, and I still think, oh, I'll just leave that over there because I'll use it somewhere else because I'm still a bit attached to it. Um, but, you know, I, I'm keenly interested in the topic and I like a lot of interesting detail, but I, look, I just knew that I would really risk disengaging um, our audience by overwhelming them with a whole lot of non-essential content um, that they're probably not as interested in as I am, you know. Um, so I really had to go back to the that those composite learner um, profiles, the persona, um, to to, and that's you know that's where I find it's really helpful. I have to return to those regularly. Mm -hmm. um, 
and the process of calling and, and, you know, sort of prioritizing content that is still going on for this cultural piece, as a matter of fact. Um, so I'm getting there, um, but it's, it's a process for me. And I really, in the end, it's because I want to make sure that I've got the content that's right for those personas, the, the learners, not the stuff that I'm necessarily interested in. So, you know, you never tool. Good for you, Gina, because it's so hard to let go of your own content, right? Uh, we're yeah. so attached to what we know and we think it's all so important and also relevant yeah. because we know it. So it's got to be important. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, Sometimes. yeah, no, good for you to keep, check, to, to keep checking in on that and, and making sure it's not about you, it's about the learner. <laughs> it's That's about it. what the learner needs to know. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa? And sometimes you can layer that content. So if there's, because there will be other learners, Gina, like you. <laughs> um, so if you can sometimes layer that extra information in resources sections, or, you know, if you're really, really interested in getting into a lot more depth, you can go here. So that's the other way that you can handle that. Um, that's that a great idea. Thanks, Lisa. That's great. Excellent. So uh, we're moving along nicely and now on to our fourth uh, must have, and this is develop a consistent high quality learning experience. We hear a lot about learning experience these days, user experience, learner experience. So Lisa, uh, what's so important about consistency in that? And what are some of the factors that, uh, that make a, a course high quality and good learner experience yeah I think I think this one is dear to both Gina and my heart and I know Yola's heart as well yeah. um that 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 really consistent experience it's all about consistent interface uh colored palette the use of visuals language all the heading styles and the navigation they're really really critical because if they're not consistent then the learner is going to be distracted by all those things and not focusing on the content and the learning experience itself. So, um, and obviously if, if you're using a tool like how to has built a lot of those standards in already, um, other tools do that as well. So having that consistency of design already built in for you even makes it easier. So then as a designer, you can come in or a writer, you can come in and just Put the create the content as opposed to worrying so much about all of those issues um yeah yeah thanks lisa we, we certainly don't need any more distractions right we're, we're so busy and so much going on in our heads um we don't have a lot of um time to hold learners attention so this is definitely a, a, an absolute must have um can we go to the next slide? We've got um, <laughs> we've got this screen here, right? Of uh, of piece of learning. Uh, I think you've all seen one of these types of images or screens before in your learning. I'm sure none of your courses look like this. Um, can you put into the chat what's wrong with this image? What's wrong with this uh, design choice? Um, would really like to hear your opinions, your thoughts on that. Feel free to pop it into the chat. <laughs> Looks dated. Yep. Old looking for sure. Yep. Anything about the design itself? I mean, it's uh, squished. Yep, definitely. Yes, colours are off too many. There you go. Great. Some great comments here. Too many fonts. Yeah. Now we're really getting into the nitty gritty of what's wrong with this design. <laughs> Absolutely. Where's the persona? <laughs> Good comment. Good question, Lexi. Great. So I'm going to go to the next screen. If we could just to soothe everyone's eyes from that previous nightmare. Um, this is another version of the same course content. Um, so this is actually from one of our own how-to modules that we created, um, one of the ready-to-go suite of content that we have. Uh, this one's about remote working. So um, 
Lisa, can you sort of share what elements we can see here that How To has created to make this course high quality? Obviously, there's quite a bit of difference, right, between the previous one we showed. Yeah, so uh, the text is readable, so we don't have this red with black text and the white content text on top of it. Um, the graphic is not skewed, and I suppose for us also, when you get it, when you create a graphical style, you really try to make it consistent throughout the whole module. That uh, inconsistent graphical styles can really be distracting for a learner. Um, we've got a clear uh, instruction as to what you need to do as a learner, um, and you know it's a bit, bit clearer that those options underneath are actually clickable. Uh, we also have the navigation at the bottom, so it's clear how you move around within the module and some clear branding on the module itself. So those yeah. are sort of the things that um, just a few few pointers there. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, I mean, that's, that's something that we all want, right? We all want high quality expert production. But let's face it, it's all about time constraint, budget constraints. Um, so I'm sure that resonates with all of you guys at local council. Um, Gina, tough question for you. How do you balance out that pursuit of quality with, with those time frame and, and timeline restraints or constraints? Yeah, look, <laughs> I love a beautiful <laughs> piece of, of work and, to, you know, I'd love to have the time and no expense spared to really produce, you know, stunning e-learning pieces. Sure. Um, probably, you know, most L&D people would. And um, I think in reality, it's almost always a compromise. Um, sometimes a learning piece just has to get out quickly as well. Yeah. Um, so look, in my career, I've, I've often relied on this, you know, idea of something I prepared earlier. Um, <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's quite environmentally friendly because it involves a lot of recycling. But, um, you know, for example, I, I use, I make really good use of the media library in how to just sort of, you know, I find these great high quality on brand kind of images or some, you know, funny little video clips and things I find that, that I think could be used. Um, and so I'll, uh, you know, even if it's down the track, I'll, I'll, I'll pop them in the media library because then they're just there already for me. Mm. Um, look, I don't know what I do without the pre-built templates actually and how to, because that saves me heaps and heaps of time. Um, and it hear. also <laughs> helps, yeah, it also helps to get a, a consistent sort of high quality, you know, look and feel so you don't, you know, tend to end up with things like different fonts and, and whatnot, because that can happen, especially if you're going at pace. Um, I will also recycle and refresh content uh, and use research from other um, courses that I've designed. So maybe something I haven't used before. So it's not so bad to have too much content, I think, if you think you might use it elsewhere. Um, yeah, and right I idea. Think I think using it, like reusing some of the content or, or some of the themes can also make the, um, you know, the course feel like it's, it has a consistent look and feel to it and even might reinforce some messages that um, you may have in other pieces uh, as well. So it's, it's um, look, at the end of the day, it's a compromise. And, and I think all learning and development professionals want to really produce beautiful work. So we, you know, we're always striving um, to produce the best that we can. I just find that, you know, this, this helps save time for me uh, using those two things in particular, the library and the, and the templates. Great, well, thanks for that insight. Thanks, Gina. So we're on our last must have. Um, so can we go to that screen, please? It is our last, but it's definitely not the least. It's about designing for diversity, for inclusion, and for accessibility, really, really hot topics these days, which I'm pleased to hear about because we've been passionate about these for many years, haven't we, Lisa? Yep, absolutely. It's in our DNA. Yeah. It's very important. Absolutely. Can you, um, we know about diversity, we know about inclusion. Not everyone really understands accessibility and accessibility guidelines. Can you provide a bit of context around that, please? Yeah, sure. So designing accessible learning is um, taking into account um, people with various abilities, uh, including those who are living with a disability. 
So, you know, today, more than ever, actually, for, for people to be able to learn and develop their skills, it's really important for their success in life. Um, and if people who are living, if people are living with a disability and they don't have equal access to that learning, learning, it's sort of like a human rights issue. So that's sort of what makes us so passionate about this. Um, and obviously the government is also behind this because these standards are also a requirement across all levels of government. Um, and it could be seen as a form of discrimination if you're not providing um, you know, an equal learning experience. So some of the things that, um, that you need to think about are, okay, so things like colour contrast. So we, talk, we saw that before with the, um, with the red and the black. So there are standards that you can check against um, to make sure that the colour contrast is there so people can actually see the text. <laughs> so if you can't see it, you can't actually consume it. Um, other examples are the font size. So even if you're not, you wouldn't call it a living with a disability, but even just aging population. Um, so problems with sight. So being able to expand the text size, and that's a key thing. And with you know, uh, Yola and I to examine you know, with our glasses and everything. So you know that that ability to increase the size, and there are specific standards about that. Um, things like closed captions. So if there is a video ensuring that is there is a transcript, closed captions, um, so that you can actually um, listen, uh, you can see, read the content um, as opposed to listening to it. Uh, other examples are if there is a graphics on the screen and they're important to the learning, we need to put in what you call an alt tag, which basically describes that graphic and then if a screen reader is reading through the screen of content, um, it will read out the description of that um, graphic if you can't see it. So it's having those alternatives to cater for people. And there's all sorts of other, you know, people who are only using a um, keyboard who can't use a mouse. There's tabbing order. There's the order of the items on screen. There's a lot of things to it. And so for us, um, we've built it into the software itself. So it makes it easy for people to create content that meets those standards. Um, so that, yeah, everybody has that, that equal, as, as close as possible, equal experience. Yeah, it's a complex area. So if you have something in a tool that can help you and guide you, that it, it, it actually takes a lot of time away, uh, you know, out of uh, the need for you to do your own research and look, look at what is accessible and what isn't. It, it really is complex. Um, and, and look, and some disabilities are completely unapparent to others, you know, especially when you're talking about things like, well, just ageing and or just even young people who just don't have, um, really good vision they, they're wearing contacts you might not even realize right so there's there's a whole bunch of people that probably work within your council that have some sort of disability but um, you wouldn't know it's it's not obvious um, and just an interesting stat there's there's 2.1 million Australians of working age who have a disability um, under about under half of those are actually employed but it's still an enormous amount of people and so yeah realistically you're working with some and I would and add just the, and I would add the point also that if you're designing for accessible learning content that's going to be good design or great design for everyone else so all of the things that you apply for people living with a disability everyone else is going to benefit from that so it, there's yeah. no disadvantage yeah, absolutely, Lisa. Yeah, Gina, how are you guys at, at council tracking with this um, final must-have? Yeah, look, I'm I'm still learning a lot in this space. Um, you know, as a rule, we we generally design for a low volume of text with high contrast and and really easy to read fonts, um, and you know, just even the language that we use is simple, get to the point. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm really interested to, in this piece that I'm working on presently, to check out some of the um, functions in the tool, because um, I think that'll really help me a lot too. Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Thanks, Gina. So we've got a final spot the no-no challenge for everyone. Uh, feel free to, to pop uh, your comments in the chat. 
Um, but what can you see here on this screen um, that is not meeting accessibility standards or that's not accessible? Yep. Yeah, the colours, the font, more specifically, yeah. Yeah, very hard to read, right? Yep, great. Thanks for all your comments. So we'll flick over to can, can I just something add two that more? is a lot more accessible. Can I add two more? Sorry. You can. Um, <laughs> go for your life. Yes. So two, two biggies in there are um, so there's no option for, um, for closed captions. So usually mm -hmm. you should have a little CC where you can see um, a, a transcript um, so that if you, um, so you can read that. Um, and the other one that's missing is, as you can see at the bottom, you've got alt text, which is just the, the, um, the title of the uh, stock uh, graphic. Whereas what we need to put in is a description of that graphic. So we need to put mm. in sort of like so-and-so and so are having an intense meeting or something like that, particularly if that is important to the meaning of that particular screen. So those are just two. Yeah, there's an interesting um, comment on the chat from Michelle. Thank you. If it was someone speaking rather than a recording, they could lip read. Any comments on that, Lisa? Uh, yeah, they could, but it's not guaranteed. Um, so we like to have both. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. We like to have both. Yay. Agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Okay. So I think, uh, we're heading to the recap section now because we've covered all five. Um, so, uh, the recap slide, please. So the key takeaways, um, we've got the create a learner persona. Feel free to take a, a snapshot of this or screen, save this or what have you. Um, but you you will get this in an We're email. We're going to share these afterwards. Yeah, we will absolutely share these. Um, but the um, the learning persona with the fictional profiles that reflect the, the target audience. So keeping these in front of mind, um, those outcomes that are practicable, practical, <laughs> measurable, and achievable. Um, and it's really honing in and focusing on those do outcomes, as Lisa was talking about. So actions or skills that are needed for the learner to get the job done. And then the logical parts, the content into logical parts, and, and the application of the learning science um, do review those ages model, those four um, sections, attention, emotion, spacing, and generation. I think it makes it so much easier. Um, and I loved your comment, Gina, the murder your darlings, although it does sound aggressive, I think there's <laughs> merit in that. Um, and then the, the consistency and the high quality learning experience. Um, again, focusing on that consistent interface uh, through colour palettes and visuals and language and navigation. Um, I think not, you know, keeping the distract distractions to a minimum. Uh, and same with design for diversity, inclusion and accessibility. Obviously, the images and need to be inclusive. Um, the language needs to be simple and clear. And of course, you know, check against those accessibility standards um, where, where possible. So uh, thanks for, for joining us today um, uh, for this quick uh, lunch and learn session. I know some of you have had to, to drop off early. Um, you will get a record. Those of you on the stool on the call, you'll get this um, as a recording in the next couple of days. We've got a little bit of time left over for some questions and answers. Um, so feel free to start posting that on the chat. Um, just also forgot with the email, you will get a free ebook with that that covers these five must have. So um, uh, keep an eye out for that. You'll also get a little surprise in the email, an offer to consider to help you um, start. So please do uh, read through that email <laughs> to, so that you don't miss out on our special offer. So now to the Q&A for those of you who can hang around and have a bit of a chat with Lisa, Gina and myself. Thanks, Lexine. Thank you so much for having, uh, you know, spending the time with us today. Really lovely to have you on. Thank you. So we'll give uh, people a few minutes to, to 
pop in their questions or comments or queries. Anything? If not, we get a little bit of free time on our hands and uh, grab a bite to eat or get back to working and creating e-learning pieces. Take it back to your, to your business and to your teams and start telling them all the things that you've learned today and that you can start applying. Pleasure, Narelle. Lovely. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, Lena. Great to have you. Thanks a lot. All right, I think if we if we don't have any questions, um, then keep an eye out for the email. You can always contact us directly um, as well. So feel free to, to call or email um, and connect with us on, on LinkedIn as well uh, with Lisa Vincent, myself, Yola Vanderhorn uh, and Gina Haidu. Feel free to connect and, and have a chat with us um, directly if you like. So thanks again for joining. Have a wonderful afternoon and hope to see you next time. Thanks, Yola. Thanks. Thank you. Another thanks, great everybody. Uh, learning. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.